Hi there! Welcome to the eighth episode of the Filters tutorial. Continuing the discussion of active filters, today we will see how we can create an active bandpass filter by cascading a low pass filter and a high pass filter. We can do that thanks to the property of active filters to provide a high input impedance and a low output impedance, which we explored in the previous episode. Let's begin! Let's work right now with a block diagram. And let's start with a block representing a low pass filter and another one representing a high pass filter. Here is the input of the low pass filter and here is the output of the high pass filter. The output of the low pass filter goes directly into the input of the high pass filter. Both low pass and high pass filters have the same cutoff frequency omega zero. Assuming that the output impedance of the low pass filter is low and the input impedance of the high pass filter is high, the input of the high pass filter will not affect the functionality of the low pass filter. In such a case, the transfer function of the whole system is equivalent to the product of the transfer functions of the single filters. As a result, we have a single filter with two coincident poles, omega zero. Let's see how this can be represented on a magnitude body diagram. To draw this diagram, remember that the y-axis is represented in logarithms. This means that the product of the two original transfer functions can be represented here as the sum of the diagrams of the two independently drawn transfer functions. So, let's see what this means on the diagram. Here are the two coincident poles. This one in blue is the body diagram of the low pass filter. This one in orange is the body diagram of the high pass filter. And this one in black represents the sum of the blue and the orange diagrams. So basically the actual body diagram of the whole circuit has the shape of a bell centered on omega zero. This means that at this center frequency the attenuation is minimal and whether we increase or decrease the frequency, the attenuation increases, which means that the output signal will be maximum at the center frequency, and otherwise it will decrease, and will decrease more with the increase of the distance between the current frequency and the center frequency. And this is the behavior of a bandpass filter, but how do we put in cascade two filters without the second influencing the first? Simple by using active low-pass and high-pass filters, which we studied in the previous episode on the filters. Here is the actual schematic of such a filter, which I have drawn using the simulator I introduced in the previous episodes. The simulator also generated the body diagram of the circuit, but let's concentrate on the circuit first. There are two op-amps, OP1 and OP2. OP1 is polarized to create a low-pass filter, like the one we saw in the previous episode. The cutoff frequency of this filter is given by R3 and C2. Remember that it is the inverse of the product of R3 and R2 divided by 2 pi. R1 and R3 define instead the gain of this circuit, which in this case is 1, since I have used two identical resistors, O100 K. This means that there is not going to be any amplification of the signal below the cutoff frequency. Given the values of R3 and C2, the calculated cutoff frequency of this low pass filter is 1.592 kHz, or about 1.6 kHz. Let's now take a look at the right side of the circuit. Here OP2 makes up a high pass active filter, where the cutoff frequency is defined by C1 and R2, while R2 and R4 define the gain. And the gain, since R2 and R4 have the same value, the gain is 1. And since the resistor and the capacitor that define the cutoff frequency have the same values of the resistors and capacitor of the low pass filter, the cutoff frequency of this high pass filter will also have the same value of 1.6 kHz. We have therefore a low pass filter whose low impedance output goes directly into the high impedance input of the high pass filter, and the two cutoff frequencies are the same. 
So, this is exactly the same situation we examined in the block diagram in which we should state a body diagram in the shape of a bell. And in fact, that is exactly the shape generated by the simulator. And if you look at the peak of the bell-shaped diagram, you can definitely see that it is located at a frequency of about 1.6 kHz, identical to the calculations. To prove that this is really what happens in reality, let's build this circuit for real, and let's test it in the lab. And here are the two filters built on two separate breadboards. This one is the low-pass filter, and this one is the high-pass filter. These headers are the input and output of this filter, and this other one is the ground connection. In the high-pass filter, this is the input and this is the output, and this other one is the ground connector. Let's now examine the two circuits independently to measure their cutoff frequency. Let's see if it is really 1.6 kHz. Let's start with the low-pass filter. Let me connect the power supply. And now we can connect the function generator between the ground and the input, and the oscilloscope between the ground and the output. Right now we have a sine wave with a frequency of 10 kHz. Let's start decreasing the frequency to move toward the cutoff frequency of this filter. Remember, this is a low-pass filter, and so decreasing the frequency, we should see an increase of the output signal magnitude. And that is exactly what's happening. We are at 2 kHz now, and now at 1 kHz, decreasing the frequency some more, and it doesn't look like the signal is increasing in amplitude any further. So let's now set up the cursor to measure voltage variations. And they are already set to measure a delta B of about 720 millivolts, which is about the delta that will tell us when we reach the cutoff frequency. Let's align the upper cursor to the tip of the sine wave. And now we will increase the frequency and we will see the amplitude of the signal decreasing. When the sine wave reaches the lower cursor, that is the point where we can read the cutoff frequency. So let's increase the frequency. 800 Hz. Adjusting the scale of the oscilloscope so we can better judge when to stop with the frequency increase. 1 kHz. Okay, this should be the right point, and the frequency read is uh, 1.7 kHz, which is close enough to the one we calculated. But you have to remember, you need to keep into account the tolerances of the components, and also, the oscilloscope doesn't show me very well the point where the cursor touches the sine wave, so everything is approximate. But having got uh, 1.7 kHz out of the expected 1.6 kHz, it's pretty good, actually. Let's measure now the cutoff frequency of the high pass filter. So let's remove the connectors of the oscilloscope and the function generator from the low pass filter. Let's remove also the power supply. And let's put the power supply on the high pass filter. And now we connect the function generator on the input of the high pass filter. And we connect the oscilloscope on the output. Since this is a high pass filter, let's start our analysis from a higher frequency. Ok, now we are at about 7 kHz, the upper cursor is already aligned with the sine wave, and so now we can go down with the frequency until we hit the second cursor. Here we are, it seems that the cutoff frequency is the same as the one of the low pass filter. And so we actually have a low pass filter and a high pass filter, which are both with the same cutoff frequency. Let's now put the two filters in cascade to see the behavior of the full circuit. We will have the low pass filter on the left and the high pass filter on the right, exactly like in the schematic. Let me remove the alligators of the function generator. I'm going to leave the oscilloscope over here since we still have to measure the signal of this output. I'm now going to connect together the power of the two circuits positive with positive, negative with negative, and ground with ground. And now I am going to connect the output of this filter to the input of the other one. And finally I am connecting the function generator to the input of the low pass filter. Right now we are exactly at 1.7 kHz, which is supposedly the center frequency of the newly made pan pass filter. Let's assume that this is all true, and let's see if we can prove it. 
Let's start with adjusting the position of the upper cursor. If all is true, whenever I change the frequency we should see the amplitude of the output signal decreasing. Let's check that out. Increasing the frequency now, and uh, yes, the signal amplitude is decreasing. Now let's go back to 1.7 kHz. And now let's decrease the frequency. And yes, the signal is decreasing again. And so, yes, it is true, whenever we move away from the center frequency, the signal amplitude decreases. And so we have proven that this circuit has exactly the behavior of a bandpass filter. We have put a low-pass and a high-pass filter in cascade with an input on the low-pass filter side. But what about if we do the opposite? What if we put the high-pass filter first and then the low-pass? Well, let's build the body diagram for this case and let's discover it. Here are the two poles again. This one in blue is the diagram of the high-pass filter, and this one in orange is the diagram of the low-pass filter. And this one in black is the sum of the two, and therefore the final diagram. And as expected, it is the exact same case as before, because overall transfer function is the product of the transfer functions of the individual filters. And if we switch the factors of the product, the final result does not change, right? And in fact, the simulator gives us exactly the same body diagram. See, I have switched the position of the low-pass and high-pass filters using exactly the same component values, and the simulator gives us exactly the same body diagrams we've seen in the previous case. Let's do a quick double-check in the lab. So, let's switch the position of the two filters and reconnect all the cables exactly the same way. Power supply wires between the boards, output of the high-pass filter into the input of the low-pass filter, now powering up the circuit, connecting the function generator, and connecting the oscilloscope. And you see that changing the frequency, the amplitude behaves exactly like in the previous case. So far, we have seen what happens if the low-pass and high-pass filters have the same cutoff frequency. But what would happen if the frequency is different? Let's show it on the drawing board. Here is a high-pass filter with cutoff frequency omega 1, and this is a low-pass filter with cutoff frequency omega 2. And here are the connections for this type of filter. And now add the body diagram. Here is omega 1, and here is omega 2, and so we now have two separate poles. Drawing in blue the diagram of the high-pass filter, and drawing in orange the one for the low-pass filter. Now, once we add them up, we see that we will still have a band-pass filter. The difference is that now we have a band larger than the one of the previous filter. Therefore, choosing appropriately the two poles, we can create a band-pass filter with a band that is as large as we desire. As simple as that. You can see now how easy it is to deal with active filters. We can cascade two or more of them to create a different kind of filters, like in the case we have analyzed today. But we can also cascade filters of the same kind, obtaining filters whose only difference is the number of poles, and therefore their order. There are still other kind of high-order filters that can be created with more peculiar schematics that use only one of pump and we will make an example of those filters in the next video of the series. And to avoid missing the next episode, make sure you have subscribed to the channel and activated the notifications. It's free and allows you to be notified also when other videos from this channel are published. You'll be happy you have done that. So, see you in the next video, and as usual, happy experiments!